Jane holds a master's in art history from Boston University's Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She's a New Hampshire native and has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. She <clears throat> founded the Courier Alzheimer's Cafe and led the tour program for the Museum of and the Frank Lloyd Wright Design Zimmerman House. She has taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. Culturally Curious's mission, her organization, is to engage, educate, and unify groups through facilitated arts experiences that inspire joy and foster critical and creative thinking, as well as an appreciation for our shared humanity. And you can find out more at Culturally Curious's website. Um, tonight, she presents Renee Magritte. Uh, Renee Magritte delighted and f fascinated audiences long before Paul Simon's favorite song, famous song. This program will focus on the life and influences of the Belgian surrealist painter whose paintings are both familiar and confounding. Discover the ways his, works, his work relates to contemporaries like Salvador Dali, and learn how art historians interpret his mysterious paintings. And I have to, I have to be honest with you. I, I thought that I thought this painting that's on the screen right now was Salvador Dali. So I'm really interested to see how the two related. So thank you so much, Jane. All right, thank you so much, Jess. And it is um, just an honor and a pri privilege to be back with you and to continue doing these programs. Uh, I'm delighted that everybody is so interested in Magritte and I'm honored to be the person to share a little bit more information about him and his artwork with you tonight. So we are in for a treat because there is something really just alluring about Magritte's work because it is so mysterious. Um, so much of it is sort of crystal clear but then the meaning is sort of purposefully not clear. And so it just keeps you coming back for more and more. Now, Magritte is an artist who is sort of famous for creating a variety of symbols like the bowler hat and the, the apple that we see on the screen here, things like a window and et cetera. But, um, but these things continue to sort of linger on in this kind of mysterious ether long after Magritte's death. But we'll take a, a good hard look in terms of what they meant to him when he was painting them. So let's just dive right in and start exploring the work of René Magritte. So let me give you the lay of the land, how we'll move through the material today. This is a photograph of the artist over here on the left, I should say, wearing one of these iconic bowler hats. He's standing in front of one of his famous paintings that's filled with floating businessmen in bowler hats. They're like little balloons in the sky. Um, here's how we'll move through the material. First, we're going to talk about surrealism in general. What is surrealism? People use that word uh, a fair amount in regular conversation. And how does it um, sort of pair up with the art movement? Then we'll take a look at the life of Rene Magritte. And then I've sort of broken uh, his work down into these four categories of illusion, juxtaposition, revelation and obfuscation. Uh, because his works are so crystal clear in, um, in the way that he can paint a, a recognizable object, I wanted to kind of bring in these elements to show you how he would make uh, a work that otherwise seems so realistic, how he would make it sur surrealistic. So those are my four categories there. And then we have a fairly extended section on his artistic legacy. He had a really enormous impact on the art world and beyond. So we'll, we'll finish up with that. So let's get started with this notion of what is surrealism. First, the word surreal. Sometimes surreal can just mean fantastic. Uh, if you spent a long time not seeing a lot of friends or loved ones uh, during the course of COVID and you might, might have reunited with them over the course of the summer, you probably use the term like this feels surreal in some way that um, it can mean fantastic, but it can also mean kind of the irrational, intense, uh, 
reality of a dream. And that is what surrealist artists were really aiming to achieve. <laughs> In their in their artwork, so um, so let's take a look at how how this unfolds, and it's a little bit of a cliche, but I'm going to start with Salvador Dali and the most famous surrealist painting of all, and that is um, the Persistence of Memory from 1931. This is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. This is a photograph of Salvador Dali from right around the time that he painted this picture. I think it's good to remember that he was a young man when he painted this picture. His famous uh, mustache is just barely growing here. Um, and so uh, he created this image that has really kind of captured uh, the, the imagination of, of the world at large. Um, and part of that is because of the way he said he created a work like this. And that was, he said he, it, um, he went into a self induced uh, hallucination, sort of like a trance. And then he painted what he saw from that trance. So again, we have this kind of crystal clear painting, but um, but it's lacking a real reality to it. We're looking at um, these little pocket watches that are melting sort of like a wheel of cheese on a hot day. And they also seem to be kind of decaying over here. There are ants congregating on them. And then right here in the middle, there's this blob. What's that blob? Well, um, most people understand it to be Salvador Dali's profile. This would be his eyebrow. These are his eyes lashes over here. Maybe this is his profile here and another melting clock. And then beyond this, the landscape itself seems very realistic. There isn't much that's very haunting about it. It's actually a depiction of, um, of the town that Dali lived in in Spain. So there was um, the, this notion of accessing this part of the mind that, um, that artists don't typically access in order to create a work of art. Now, this all goes into this larger idea of what is surrealism. This uh, gentleman that I have on the screen here is named Andre Breton, and he was sort of at the heart of the, um, of the invention of surrealism. This is at the beginning of the 1920s. This um, it all sort of starts in Paris and it explodes from there. It goes worldwide. And there were actually two surrealist groups, but this is the group that sort of won out in terms of their philosophy. Breton um, published his surrealist manifesto. And, um, and he talked about uh, creating works of art that were super realistic, that went beyond reality into the surreality. So why are artists interested in accessing or depicting a surreality at this point in history? Well, if we think about Europe in the beginning of the 1920s, this is a part of the world that is still reeling from the First World War. The world had never seen a war like that before. And so artists were thinking and responding to, to the feelings that they had coming out of this, coming out of um, you know, the, the loss of life, the, the irrational um, participation in something that, that ended up being so grotesque in terms of um, uh, uh, sort of new ways of, of killing people and, and new ways of harming people that lasted long beyond the war itself. So you had one artistic move, movement called Dadaism, which was just um, sort of uh, purposely absurd. And coming out of that, you have surrealism, where you have artists who are really interested in accessing the unconscious, a different part of the brain. It's almost like an escape from the real world that has become almost too hard to bear in some ways. So if you're accessing the unconscious, you have a, a critical player here, and that is um, the work, at least, of Sigmund Freud. And this is a, photo a photograph of Freud from 1931. He's getting his portrait sculpted alongside of him. Now, of course, he is the father of psychoanalysis. And alongside uh, that, he's someone who wrote about and really explored this notion of the unconscious, this part of our brain that that, um, that we're not completely in touch with, but we, um, we can sort of access in certain moments of our lives, including when we're sleeping. So he uh, is also the author of The Interpretation of Dreams and subsequent editions of that text. He actually assigned specific symbols to things that you would see, objects that you would see in your dreams. So all of this is really contributing to the way 
that surrealist artists are picturing the world and even creating art. It's influencing their process. So let's take a look at this work right here. This is what's called an automatic drawing. And the artist here is uh, André Masson. And um, so art historians would call this an example of automatism. What he's done here is um, he's essentially just put his pen on a piece of paper and he's moving it around wildly. And from that, uh, sort of letting go of his conscious brain and letting his unconscious brain take over. And so the belief was that little figures and and, and um, references to the, the the real world would sort of emerge from an uh, from a process like that. And um, Masson would go back in and sort of fill out some of these drawings to and, and enhance those little pieces that looked like little glimpses of reality or surreality. Uh, this work in particular is also in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Now, surrealism started off as sort of like a collective exercise. This was a group of artists who were sort of agreeing on, on what they wanted to do in terms of artwork, how they wanted to picture the world. So they were also really interested in creating works of art together. And they did it, uh, one way that they did it is with this exercise or a parlor game really that's called the exquisite corpse. And what they would do or what this game is. Actually, there are table games today where you can still do this. Um, or you can just simply take a piece of paper and fold it into fourths or, or thirds. And somebody starts off uh, drawing a picture and they might extend the lines past the fold, but then fold their part over, hand it off to the next person who extends that drawing from there. They fold their portion over and the next artist contributes the next section. And then you unfold the picture and the result is something startling. It's something completely novel and um, oftentimes can be fairly unsettling when you look at it. And this is certainly um, one of the goals of, of the surrealist object. So these are all examples of surrealist object, uh, surrealist artists kind of playing that exquisite corpse game and, um, and the result of, of those efforts. I mean, these are really the kinds of images that weren't really being produced in the world of art prior to this movement. Now, the last note that I wanted to make about surrealism is this idea that it is about um, being playful, but there's oftentimes this kind of menacing quality to it too. These are two examples of surrealist sculpture, probably the best known examples. On the left, we have Merritt Oppenheimer's uh, sculpture that's simply called Object. It's from 1936. It's in the collection of MoMA as well. Over here on the right is Salvador Dali's Lobster Telephone from 1938. This is in the collection of the Tate. So both of these objects, if you think about using them, uh, sort of create this visceral reaction. <laughs> Can you imagine sipping your tea from a fur-lined teacup or uh, stirring it up with a fur-lined spoon? Can you imagine holding a telephone to your ear with a lobster sort of wiggling its legs around your ear? Uh, so once again, it's bringing two sort of disparate objects together and creating a whole new reaction in the audience by this juxtaposition. All right, so all of this brings us to um, our artist of the evening, Renee Magritte. And doesn't this picture just seem like a breath of fresh air after imagining that lobster telephone? This is a, a painting that he made in 1960 called The Heartstring. And we get a little glimpse in terms of, of what he's all about in a picture like this. We have a robin's egg blue sky here with this giant fluffy white cloud. It looks like a cotton ball in some ways. And it's just resting on this wine glass. Um, some art historians refer to this as a punch bowl, but this, this vessel here, um, this giant glass vessel that is um, larger than the mountains beyond it. The vessel is sitting in the outdoors in this giant green field. And so we've got this um, 
sort of shifting sense of scale as your eye moves around through this picture. But there is also a peacefulness to this particular picture, a tranquility here. And um, it might not be surprising to know that he painted this for his wife. There is, um, there's just something kind of romantic about this picture. But we see that Magritte is not necessarily um, going for the same kind of reaction or result as somebody like Salvador Dali. They had very different processes. René Magritte was essentially painting realist paintings um, using uh, his own methodology to create a surrealism. And that's what we'll be looking at tonight. He wasn't going into any sort of trance. And whereas uh, Dali was a showman and very flamboyant throughout his life, René Magritte was wearing his bowler hat and painting at his easel, wearing a suit for decades. <laughs> All right, so with, with, without much more being said, let's turn our attention to the artist René Magritte. And we've got his dates here on the screen. He was born just before the turn of the century and he lived into the space age. Um, I believe he died at the age of 68, so relatively young. And he was born in Belgium, raised in Belgium, and spent most of his life there. He was the oldest of three boys. This is him in a photograph from 1905 and uh, another photograph with his brothers and his father just about a year later. We don't know much about his childhood, but we do know that he began drawing lessons around the age of 12. So he probably showed some early interest and some early promise there. And he did receive a, a pretty traditional um, uh, formal education in the arts as, as a young man. Now, missing from these pictures, but is apparent in these photographs, is his mother. And his mother um, died by suicide when he was just a, a young man, when he was in his early teens. And we know that she had really struggled with mental health for years prior to her suicide. So, um, so some art historians like to connect a lot of his work back to this early trauma in his life. And um, he himself kind of discounted a little bit of that and even sort of discounted um, uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, agreed or accepted reading of some of his major works that were tied, uh, traditionally tied to his, his mother's death. I'll share a little bit of that, but, but knowing that he discounted it, I think we should keep that in mind too. But since these artists are interested in, in psychoanalysis, I'll throw a little bit of that in along the way. So when he was a young man, he loses his mother, but he also meets a young woman named Georgette Berger. And um, they met as young teens and then reconnected about seven years later and were married. This is a photograph taken in 1922, the year that they were married. And you see, you know, real uh, affection there, real intimacy. This is a photograph from a few years later. Um, and this is the, the artist with his dog. So once again, if you know that Paul Simon song, it's probably all queued up in your brain right now. We'll get to that one as well. Um, Georgette Berger was was, or Georgette Magritte was an artist in her own right. And in addition to being his wife, she was his muse and his model. And sometimes these, I should mention, both of these uh, paintings are by Magritte and uh, painted in the 1930s. And this earlier uh, depiction of his wife, he uh, absolutely idealizes her. I should say, um, he, he transforms this image of her repeatedly throughout his career into something that is a very sort of, I, I think, disturbing and sort of menacing. It's, it's so disturbing um, that I decided to omit it from, from this program. But if it's something that you wanted to look up, those images that are kind of based on this portrait of his wife are called rape. I believe all of them are called rape. Um, so this realistic portrait of her painted just a few years later still has the hallmark of so many kind of Magritte um, symbols here. Well, first of all, we've got the, the blue sky and the clouds in the background. But over here, he just has kind of this random assemblage of objects that are circling this realistic portrait of her that seems to be floating in the sky. So as it turns out, the same year that he was married, a poet friend of his introduced him to this painting here. This is a painting by the Italian metaphysical artist, Di Cerico. 
this was, um, it's, it's called uh, the love song or the song of love. And it was painted in 1914. So it wasn't a brand spanking new idea when Magritte saw it, but when he saw it, he wept. There is something about this painting and, uh, and Decherco's work in particular, that was really powerful and really spoke to Magritte. Um, it, he felt as though Decherco was kind of, um, unveiling almost like the interior life of these objects by randomly assembling them this way that he uh, was like revealing a new meaning an inner meaning to them and and that was um sort of transformative in in terms of uh, of his work as an artist so of course what are we looking at here <laughs> we're looking at um this wall that uh, sort of plays with scale here because we have a sculptural fragment of, of a face, a human face that just seems enormous compared to the building next to it. We also have an enormous rubber glove, which is inexplicably just tacked to this wall. We have a pin also pushed into the wall. And then here in the foreground, a green ball. Uh, in the background, there's this suggestion of a locomotive. And then we notice here, there's another sort of perfect blue sky and a little puff of steam from that locomotive. So DeCherico created these, um, they're sort of like cityscapes, but they are quiet, they are empty, and they almost always have this random assemblage of objects. And that was really what Magritte took away from, from De Cherico. If we even look back to that portrait of his wife, look at this. I mean, there's a bird, a key, a note, and a, a, and a glove, which might have been directly inspired by De Cherico. So Magritte finds um, his voice as an artist pretty early on, but he has to pay the bills. And so he starts off working as a commercial artist, uh, a, as an advertiser, essentially. And he does that um, through for, for decades, even after he becomes a, a worldwide uh, phenomenon. He's uh, internationally recognized. Both of these images are from the 1920s, the mid 1920s, and these are um, cover sheets for, for um, music. And you can see in both of them that he's kind of referencing the art historical past, maybe a little bit of Toulouse-Lautrec over here with the Moulin Rouge windmill in the background. Maybe there's a little bit of, of Van Gogh over here with the cherry blossoms in the background. But, um, but, but he lands on surrealism right around the same time. This is a picture that's called Attempting the Impossible from 1928. And we see how young he was as he's starting his career as a surrealist art, uh, artist. This is of course the same picture in process just behind him. I always like to get a sense of scale there too. So we have kind of the, the classic Pygmalion myth, a male artist who's creating a female uh, work of art and in, in the myth, he falls in love with her because she's so beautiful. And here it's sort of a, an image that's kind of drained of all of the love, the warmth, the affection. This nude that he's creating is um, almost strikingly cold. He's painting her sort of scientifically, mechanically. He's not even looking at her affectionately, really. So, um, but he is playing with our sense of space and, 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 and perception because he is painting her um, occupying the same space that he is as though she is a sculpture when in fact he is painting her. So what happens now is Magritte and his wife, they move to Paris. They they're, you know, rubbing elbows with Dali and Breton, and they spend about three years there. But in the end, they come back to Belgium, and it's kind of a financial loss for them. So he dives right back into advertising. He and his brother open up their own little shop, essentially, and he creates advertisements for everything under the sun that you can imagine, except as far as I know, bowler hats. <laughs> so, um, so this is really what pays the bills from, you know, the beginning of, or the late 1920s to, you know, I don't know, the mid 1940s, really, he's working as an advertiser, but he is also painting. Um, and, and strangely enough, during these tumultuous times in the world, during World War II, essentially, 
he starts looking back at other artists and other styles from decades before him. In this case, he's looking back at the impressionist artist Renoir, and he sort of starts copying Renoir's brushwork and his themes. Renoir went through a whole period where he was um, painting these golden bathers that often had these like long, gorgeous tresses like this. And this in, in the Magritte work on the right, you can see him sort of quoting Renoir with, um, with these beautiful nudes, with the long golden hair, and even the feathery broken brushwork. But he makes it a little bit surrealist by adding the frog on her back. <laughs> so um, he also goes through a period where he essentially adopts the color palette of the Fauvis paintings who were work or uh, Fauvis painters who are working around the beginning of the 1900s. And here he is doing this roughly 40 years later. So this is like an original Fauvis painter by um, Duren. It's a landscape painted with these anti-naturalistic colors. And this is Magritte's take on it. Again, these references to the landscape, you can see like a blue tree over here. Um, but there is that sort of playful, nonsensical quality to it, the surrealist quality with the bunnies playing drums. So it's interesting that his experiments, his deviations away from, from surrealism um, are always sort of backwards looking and they don't really advance him as an artist. And he always goes back to surrealism and he almost always goes back to the, the, the same themes again and again and again. He finds, you know, these symbols like the bowler hat and he repeats them for decades. And you can either attribute that to the fact that he as, a, as an advertiser sort of knew what worked or he just became really good at copying himself um, or, or in the end, he just became personally fascinated um, with, um, with these particular images. So the, uh, the painting on the left is called The School Teacher from 1954. This is like a classic Magritte painting right here. We see a businessman in a bowler hat from behind. He's sort of inaccessible. We don't know him. He's faceless. He's um, uh, uh, sort of unknowable, I should say. And uh, we've got this mysterious crescent moon that hangs over the top of his head in this otherwise sort of blue fading into evening sky. And then we have a photograph of the artist from the mid 1960s um, playing with that bowler hat motif again, turning it upside down on his own head. So once again, just important to keep in mind that he decides to play himself as like the straight man to the really eccentric um, surrealists that continue working um, sort of side by side, uh, but you know, in, in um, in sort of different geographic regions throughout the 1930s and, and beyond. So um, interestingly enough, he adopts this symbol of, of the bowler hat and he even wears the bowler hat for decades after it is popular. In the 1920s, everybody was wearing them. It was ubiquitous. But by the 1960s, when this photograph was taken, it was, nobody was wearing it. Um, so you can't he, get the audio. I can't get the audio. So he continues to, um, uh, he, he decides that this mark of anonymity is his, is his signature. So let me just see if Jess is available because it seems like we're having some audio issues. I am here, I'm trying to, okay. <clears throat> we were trying to help them, okay. um, but somebody, let's see, where did the people go? All right, if, if those people want to, are they, are you having audio issues? Yeah. Is anyone having audio issues? Can you hear me? Did you go into the problems that we have? Yes. I can hear you. You're having trouble um, too? Audio is fine I here. I hear nothing. No. So it's not us. You want the light on? No. Yeah, that, there's no trouble hearing it. Not us that must be yours. Who is, it, who is having some trouble? Robert Lippman? Did you try? Okay. Um, some, some people have recommended um, logging out and logging back in again. Do you want to try that? I have no sound. Can you, Can you hear me? 
Yes or no, light? I turned off. No, off. no, it's it's done. I don't think I can watch this. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, if you can hear me, can you hear me? All right. We will send around the recording to everybody after the after the event, okay? Okay. All right. Well, thank you everybody for your patience and apologies, um, Jane. Sorry. No, no that. problem. No problem. I, I, I'm honored that people are trying so desperately to hear. <laughs> um, and Violet, thanks for sending the note that the, re that the recording will go out. I appreciate that. All right. So now we have our introduction to Magritte. We've got a sense of who he, he was and the kind of work that he produced. So let's dive into looking at these four categories that I just kind of created my Myself for um, for tonight's program, but I think they sort of help us understand who he was a, as an artist, and also, um, you know, really what were his goals when he was creating a work of art. So the first is illusion, and part of that is about creating something that's really realistic, easy to identify, and part of that also speaks to his technical ability as an artist. And so we'll look at how he uses illusion to create something that is often surreal. So our first example here is called The False Mirror from 1929. This is also in the collection of MoMA. What a collection they have. So in The False Mirror, we are, of course, looking at this zoomed in image of an eyeball. And there is a lot about this eyeball that seems very real. Notice the, the little shine over here in the, in the corner of the eyeball. And that suggests kind of the dampness of the eyeball. But then this picture that seems um, very three-dimensional in many ways becomes uh, just completely flattened out when we look at the iris, which seems to be reflecting that classic Rene Magritte blue sky with fluffy clouds. And so, um, so the eye seems like it could be looking at the sky, but we all know that our eyes don't really reflect the sky in the same way. Um, so, so it's a startling picture. It was owned by the, uh, another surrealist artist named Man Ray for several years. And he said, this is a picture that you don't just just look at, it looks out at you. Now, this is sort of a, a spoiler for looking at a lot of these images. If you think back to that parlor game, the exquisite corpse where artists just kind of folded over a piece of paper and added their own little um, drawing. And then in the end, there was this, um, there was a work that everybody had contributed to. Think of that when you think of the way Magritte named his paintings. His paintings almost, or his titles almost never give us insight into his paintings. He would have a group of friends over every week and they would essentially play a, uh, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the <laughs> word equivalent of, of the exquisite corpse. It was like a poetry game. And that is how he would find the names for these paintings. So false mirror in this case, um, doesn't, it, it sort of aligns with what we're looking at here, but it doesn't in this case, provide some sort of um, deeper understanding. And Magritte did this very purposely because he didn't want there to be um, one easy way to understand these paintings. He wanted you to spend a lot of time with them. Now, his, this next work here is another picture that I put under this category of illusion, because of course, that is what is, is happening here. He called this picture, the human condition from 1933. And he painted a number of pictures that look almost exactly like this or are painted very similarly. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at um, a window that is framed by these drapes. And there's a landscape outside of the window with the classic room name a great um, sky with the clouds and then sort of this lush green landscape in the foreground. And then inside the room that we are occupying, there's also an easel with a canvas, a painted canvas on that easel. We can just see the seam of it here. And um, it would seem as though the, uh, the landscape on that canvas, it perfectly extends or continues um, past the canvas and um, and across the surface of this window. So again, he's playing uh, with our notion of reality and perception because we can we, we see how it connects to the outdoors, 
there's a pleasure in making that connection. And then all of a sudden it sort of dissolves when we realize that nobody could paint a picture that necessarily looks exactly like that. Um, so, and of course he's also playing with this very notion of that this is a painting of the outdoors because it's, uh, it looks like a painting within a painting, but it is all just one painting. That is the illusion here, of course. And of course, the name doesn't necessarily mean anything or give us insight into it. Uh, Magritte wanted these to be purposefully um, uh, mysterious works. I feel like I should say that at the end of, of, uh, of talking about every picture. He said, the titles of the pictures are not explanations and the pictures are not illustrations of the titles. The relationship between title and picture is purely poetic. So here's another example of, um, of the human condition. And in this case, I think you can see uh, how he's borrowed a lot of visual motifs from De Cherico. So we've got uh, this rounded arched door, like the doors over here. Um, and we've got the ball, <laughs> the mysterious ball in, in the foreground here. And just like the image that we saw before, there is a painting on an easel representing a landscape that seems to perfectly connect and align, look at the horizon line here, with the landscape that is in the background of this picture. So it's playing with our perception of reality by creating something that's very illusionistic. Like I said, he did a, a lot of uh, versions of this and this is him kind of riffing off the same theme here. This is a picture that he called the key of the fields from 1936. And instead of using um, a canvas that sits in front of uh, a window, here he is suggesting that the surface of the window itself sort of functions as a canvas in some ways. Um, and in this case, that glass is broken. And so the broken shards that would have held that image like a canvas are, um, are, are sort of uh, gathered together here on the floor. And we just see fragments of that same landscape that we see out past the window there. So once again, um, playing with our perception of reality and, um, and our, just our perception in general, really. Um, but Magritte said, it's not my intention to make anything comprehensible. I am of the opinion that there are sufficient paintings which one understands after a shorter or longer delay, and that therefore some incomprehensible painting would now be welcome. <laughs> so he's really trying to create something that is going to uh, make you scratch your head for years to come. Now, in the last decade or so of his career, I think his technical ability becomes uh, even more enhanced. It's, it's like uh, um, really fine tuned. And I think with a work like the one that we see on the left, I always feel like he's showing off. This is a picture that's called The Prepared Bouquet and it's from 1957. And so you can see I've paired it here with um, an early uh, Italian Renaissance painting by the artist Botticelli. And this is the painting Primavera. It's, uh, it was painted in the 1470s or 80s, and it continues to be this very mysterious painting. Scholars are always debating what is it, what is actually going on in this work. But we do know that this figure here in Primavera or Springtime is the figure of um, Flora. She's an allegorical figure representing flowers. And Rene Magritte has perfectly copied her. He's transcribed her into his own painting. Now, if any of us could transcribe floor this well, you know, our careers would be well and done, but he's added a great deal of mystery beyond that. He's transcribed her onto the back of one of these anonymous businessmen wearing a bowler hat. And of course, by 1957, nobody's wearing bowler hats anymore. Bowler hats are his symbol for anonymity. Um, and in this case, uh, even though we have this reference to flowers in, in the figure and in the title of the work, uh, whatever this figure is looking at in the background, it's this lush green forest, it doesn't have flowers in it. And he is sort of separated it by, uh, from it by this low railing here. This is also a motif that he copies again and again and again, um, a low railing that separates the figure out from, from the background. So it, it starts, um, it, it starts pushing us to wonder about what is this connection here between the, the Botticelli figure, the businessman, the setting here, um, this notion of a prepared bouquet, you would imagine. 
uh, somebody holding that, presenting that. And here she seems to be kind of hovering on his back um, and he seems to be unaware. So he's playing with um, what our expectations of both the setting, the subject and the title might suggest here, but he is showing off in terms of what he can do um, with his illusionistic brushwork. One last painting that I wanted to show you in this category, which um, really just delves straight into illusion, is this picture called The Blank Signature, which is um, from 1965. And here we've got another sort of green forest, just like we saw before. Now we have a female protagonist and she is on horseback. And the illusion that is happening here is, um, is that he's taken these, um, these strips basically of tree trunks and background, and he's weaving them around the rider and the horse. So some overlap and then they underlap um, and you can, and it's breaking down our entire sense of three-dimensional space here to create essentially an optical illusion, a really playful optical illusion. So once again, the titles are, are sort of playful. The pictures can be very playful. Um, and, um, and, and, uh, and Magritte is using this technical skill that he has to enhance this, this notion of mystery that he wanted to generate in his pictures. Now, our next category here is juxtaposition. And this is really what all of these surrealist artists were so interested in, this notion of, um, of taking two disparate things, putting them together and creating a real visceral reaction from their audience. So I remind you of um, Oppenheimer's work and, um, and Dali's work over here. So, um, so Magritte experimented with this as well. He would take a disparate object and insert it uh, with, with other objects that you would imagine being together. And he would completely change the tone and perhaps the meaning of the entire picture by doing that. So this is a painting from 1935 that he called The Portrait. And of course, by adding an eyeball to this meal that's sitting in front of us, it seems as though we're looking down at our own table here, by adding that eyeball, it creates a completely unsettling feeling. We've got our fork and our knife here, and it's almost as though he's asking us to imagine cutting into this food that is looking right out at us. I would say that this is his equivalent to Dali's uh, lobster telephone here, but he's he didn't go into any trance in order to create it. This is something that he imagined, and he knew that by bringing those two um, disparate objects together, it would create a real reaction in us. Sometimes um, combining or juxtaposing images like this just creates a sense of mystery. And in some cases, uh, uh, this sort of ominous mystery, he called this picture threatening weather. This is from 1929. And if you don't imagine these objects hanging in the sky, looking uh, painted in grayscale, sort of looking like clouds, this would be a really sort of simple and serene landscape. But he has painted a woman's torso, he's painted a tuba, and he's painted a chair. And he squished them all together, they're just slightly overlapping, to suggest that they have some deeper meaning, that they have, that they're interconnected, that they're related. And, um, and by being on this sort of super large scale, by hovering in the sky like clouds, that there's a, a greater message to the assemblage of these objects. This is what he got out of DeCherico's painting, this, this notion of revealing um, the kind of inner life of an object, uh, uh, something beyond its regular everyday meaning uh, that you can only really achieve when you're juxtaposing strange things in this way. I should say he was visiting Dali when he uh, created this painting. So he was in Spain and, um, and he, uh, he purposely said, I do not paint my visions, I describe objects. So you can imagine him hang, hang, hanging around with Dali and just almost rolling his eyes at what he was doing. He's like, I'm here to describe. So um, just uh, on that same note, this is another work that he created called Youth Illustrated. This is from 1937. It's the exact same concept. It's a very serene landscape, an otherwise unremarkable landscape. And then <laughs> lined up along this path are things that maybe are a reference to, to youth, but in the end, they just seem like a, a random assemblage. We see the same 
items that we just saw before. There's the chair, there's the tuba, and there's the woman's torso. So, um, so he's, he's asking us to kind of make sense out of why he chose these strange things. A pool table might make sense uh, um, in reference to a painting called Youth Illustrated, but certainly a lion <laughs> wouldn't. So he is, um, he's, he's really kind of testing us. The artist Max Ernst once described Magritte's works as collages painted entirely by hand. And I see that in particular with this picture. You can almost imagine him cutting out these unrelated objects and kind of lining them up along this road. Now, juxtaposition is used really effectively in these last two works in um, simple but powerful ways. And I remember seeing this, this work, you know, back when I was an undergrad and, um, and hearing that it, had, um, <laughs> that it had this much deeper meaning than what we were looking at, that it was about like Einstein and the theory of relativity. And it was about time and motion and all of these different things. But for Rene Magritte, this was about juxtaposi juxtaposition. And so this is a picture that he called time transfixed. And I think that title probably led a lot of people to think that it was about um, things related to science and time and motion. But in fact, Magritte was not satisfied with the way the, the title of this work was translated because in the French, if, you, if you're a little bit more faithful to, to the French, it would be translated to ongoing ta time stabbed by a dagger. <laughs> so he painted this work for a man named um, Edward James, who was a, a really sort of um, major patron of surrealist artists. And Magritte was at his house. He painted this, uh, this mantle in his dining room. And this is a really sort of faithful representation of the man's mantle that had the clock and the mirror. And Magritte, of course, simply added the, the train coming out of the chimney, sort of like it's barreling out of a tunnel. Magritte thought that, that his patron should hang this picture at the bottom of the stairs um, in the entryway so that people would feel like they were being stabbed by the train or stabbed by time as they came through his um, his entryway, but uh, but the the person who bought this work of art actually decided to hang it in his house just where this where this um, mirror is hanging, so just above his own mantle. Interesting. So the last painting under this category of juxtaposition that I wanted to share with you is um, this image that's called the Empire of Light or the Dominance of Light. This particular image is from 1954, but Magritte painted this image and variations of it uh, close to 30 times throughout his career. This was um, an, uh, a concept that he was really fond of, apparently, or he knew that it would sell very well. So um, I should say that I, this is one image where the juxtaposition sort of went over my head. It always just reminded me of you know this time of year really as it gets um, as it starts getting uh, darker a little bit earlier but it's still summer and so you know inside can feel dark but the sky is still kind of light but he was looking for a really stark um, disparity between the lightness of the sky that classic blue with the fluffy clouds and the darkness of this little town or village here where the lights are just coming on in particular that street light so um, so it's I mean as simple as it can get it's light and dark here and Magritte said I we must not fear daylight just because it almost always illuminates a miserable world and I think he thought that if you spend more time with this picture you feel a little bit more isolated, you feel the quiet, and you feel a little sense of sadness here. For me personally, it's it's hard to feel the sadness when there's um, the blue skies out there. So our next category is revelation. And I called it revelation because with so many of Magritte's works, he is using um, illusion and juxtaposition to create a joke. So our revelation is sort of an aha and a ha ha <laughs> together. And that brings us to his most famous painting, which is called The Treachery of Images. Um, so what we're looking at here is a painting from 1929. And it is a really straightforward, realistic representation of a pipe. It almost looks like an advertisement for a pipe. Um, 
but the treachery of images all comes from the text that he has included here at the bottom. Ceci n'est pas un pipe. So the text translates, of course, to this is not a pipe. So once again, sort of like those illusion pictures, he's playing with, um, with the very notion of representation. And in this case, he's calling out the fact that, that this representation of a pipe, this painting of a pipe, is not in fact a pipe. And that is actually supposed to create a good chuckle in all of you. I'm glad you're on mute tonight because maybe you're not laughing out loud at this one, but it was supposed to be funny. Um, but it was also supposed to be kind of mind blowing because artists weren't supposed to really recognize this in their work. I should also uh, note that that uh, this, this notion of calling out the lack of reality in, in the work also extends to the text itself, because when it says this is not a pipe, of course, the text itself is not a pipe. And, um, and Magritte, if you hadn't caught on already, is somebody who really liked text. He wrote a great deal throughout his life, anything from novels to poems to treatises. Um, and so he was very playful with his use of text and, and image through, throughout his career. But this is really... Um, that that work that I think people have latched onto. This is this is the work that combines text and image and playfulness um, in um, in a way that no artist ever had before him. This kind of opened doors for conceptual artists, for pop artists. Um, so this is really groundbreaking. In fact, there's um, there's a philosopher Foucault who essentially wrote a whole book just on this painting. <laughs> but just to give you a sense in terms of how Magritte would sometimes use text in his paintings in other ways. This is a painting that was called um, The Literal Meaning from 1928. And what we're looking at here in this kind of circle-like frame is the text that says femme triste or sad female. So any other artist would have just painted the woman, <laughs> but Magritte's being playful and he's painting sort of a, uh, the framed text of, you know, in almost like a placeholder, like the sad woman would go here. So this becomes his motif. And he goes back to it quite a bit throughout his career. He is the king of repetition. So these two examples are from the 1960s. Over here, this is a picture that he called force of habit. It's almost like he can't stop doing this motif. So here he says, this is not an apple when of course it is a painting of an apple. But down here, he's added the text. This is not a Magritte. <laughs> um, when of course it's a painting by Magritte. He's even included this little bird in a cage and we'll see more birds in in his works uh, this evening over here we have the most realistic apple he's ever painted and once again he's using text here to deny that this is not an apple or un palm so um so like i said this this becomes his, his it's his breakthrough notion in art and it's what he's sort of best known for and in fact in brussels there's even a street that's been called ceci n'est pas une rue this is not a street so um, one other major picture that he uses this kind of aha revelation uh, motif in is this picture that's called Clairvoyance from 1936. So it, uh, it's a self-portrait of the artist at the easel, carefully studying his subject, and that is in this case an egg, and then uh, describing in great detail a full-grown bird on his easel. So again, this is supposed to be playful. It's supposed to be a joke. You're supposed to laugh. Thank God you're not laughing here. <laughs> Thank God you're on mute. So I can not hear you not laughing. But um, but but there is a, you know, there's there's a humorous aspect to this notion that somebody would carefully study something to describe it later after it's it's transformed. But Magritte liked to play with this very notion of what an object is, what the interior life of an object is. And he goes back to uh, birds quite a bit. Here's a photograph of the artist with the painting in process. I love this. It's sort of like a picture within a picture within a picture. Um, and then here's just one other uh, reference to, or another example, I should say, of this revelation. And this is uh, a, a depiction of of, of something that he said he actually witnessed once in his own house, in his bedroom. He woke up one night and instead of seeing his bird in the birdcage, he saw a giant egg. So it's still playing with that notion of, um, 
of uh, the, the reality and, and uh, of, of an object in our perception of an object. And, and they are supposed to be sort of humorous. So moving quickly, because I know we're short on time, our next category here is obfuscation. And this really speaks to uh, Magritte's personal life. And so I'll do a little bit of psychoanalysis for some of these works, but obfuscation, hiding things, hiding behind things, hiding the uh, literal meaning of things is a very important concept for surrealist art and essential to uh, so many Magritte paintings. So both of these pictures are called The Lovers. They're both from 1928. And I, I get a kick out of these pictures because of course they're, they're supposed to be pictures about intimacy, emotional or physical between two people. And um, they are obfuscated, they are veiled, they have they are shrouded, they've got uh, a cloth over their head that is literally preventing a real kiss in this case, or over here, it's preventing this uh, physical connection, this contact. I love this picture on the right because they look like they're posing for a selfie. Um, so he's being playful here, but um, the incident from Magritte's childhood where his mother died by suicide, there was this story that art historians repeated for many years that he woke up in the night, went down to the river um, because he knew his mother had been missing and her body was found. And when she was pulled from the river, her nightgown was wrapped around her face. So for years, art historians were saying that these pictures were about the inaccessibility of his mother. And he said, no, that was not actually my experience. But he created several of these pictures the same year, 1928, of shrouded, veiled figures. And this picture in particular is called the invention of life. And so you, it, you almost have to start wondering, you know, is this about life and death over here on the right? Is this in fact a reference to his mother in some other way? Um, even if he didn't see her, her, um, her body shrouded, is this a way of dealing with her death uh, without actually having to physically depict it. Um, some people think that this image over here looks like his mother. I think it also looks like depictions of his wife. So that's a little bit hard to tell, but uh, it does seem like a picture like this one seems to be uh, so kind of grappling with issues of, of life and death here. Uh, one last shrouded picture over here on the left is called the heart of the matter or the central story. This is from that same year, 1928. And this one seems a little bit more sinister. She almost seems like she's choking. Um, and so we've got another shrouded figure. We don't see her face. Uh, she seems to be in distress. She's not, you know, kissing somebody in this picture. And then there's this random assemblage of objects. So it sort of reminds me of threatening weather here with the tuba and the woman's torso. Um, it's almost as though, you know, we've got a shrouded face over here that you can't even see. But there's something about the, the random assemblage here, this suggestion of a crime or violence that sort of reminds me of the game Clue, like she was killed uh, while traveling with a tuba. <laughs> and in fact, Magritte uh, uh, just uh, consumed crime novels. So I think it, it maybe isn't so far of a leap to, to imagine that he's, he's putting these disparate things together and creating this kind of menacing effect with them for us to imagine what the crime might have been. Uh, another example of obfuscation of hiding meaning is um, this portrait that he created in 1937 that's called Not to be Reproduced. And this was a portrait of that same man, the major patron of surrealist artist, Edward James, um, the same man who commissioned Time Transfixed over here. This is that same mantle the same mirror. And here we have uh, the, the, the man's back. And instead of the reflection of his face in the mirror, we have the repetition of that same form, the back uh, of, the, of the man. So he is unknowable. He's completely inaccessible. And if you have seen any scary movies in the past decade, you have seen this motif. I, I guarantee it. Um, this is a very unnerving representation. The, the idea that um, somebody's looking in the mirror and you 
can't see their face, you can't see their reflection is very haunting. And that's why um, filmmakers uh, borrow the, this idea again and again and again. And that brings us to sort of the star of the night. And that is this painting that was on our title slide this evening. This is called The Son of Man from 1964, probably one of his best known images. Believe it or not, this is uh, uh, understood to be a self-portrait as well. So there's a lot happening in this picture. There's a little bit of juxtaposition. Um, of course, you know, the juxtaposition of the man and the apple here. <laughs> there's illusion, certainly. I mean, everything seems crystal clear. Um, but the fact that we can't see his face is both menacing and alluring here. We just see a little bit of his eyes kind of peeking around the edges. Um, this is an unusual painting because Magritte is giving us this kind of stormy sky in the background. This is pretty unusual for him. Something seems off with this picture. If you have really good eyes here, you might even notice that this gentleman's arm is bent backwards over here. This is his elbow that looks like it's bending out towards us. We've got that low barrier behind him, um, kind of separating him out from the background behind him. And, and he's like so many other, of, uh, other examples of, of Magritte's work where he is completely, um, uh, un, sort of unremarkable, unknowable, because he's not facing us. But here, we get a little bit of a taste of who he is, but we don't really know. The title, Son of Man, seems to suggest something grander here. Son of Man is usually a reference to Jesus in, in a religious painting. And then you have the apples. This is some sort of reference to Adam and Eve. It's hard to pull at those threads without them just kind of unraveling really quickly because um, of course, Magritte didn't want this to have a larger meaning. That's not to say that um, art historians don't try really, really hard. Uh, so this is just a, a reminder here that this is in so many ways a representation of the artist himself and that signature bowler hat that he kept on wearing well into the 1960s. Now, Son of Man was actually part of a series, which I don't think a lot of people know about. This is sort of the, um, the feminine counterpart in that series. And this is a painting that's called The Great War from the same year, 1964. The title, I think, um, uh, sort of suggests, uh, once again, kind of a greater meaning here. And art historians spill a lot of ink trying to decode exactly what's, what they think the connection back to, to war, whether it's World War I or World War II at this point, could be. Uh, in this case, the woman's face is completely obscured by flowers. I read those as um, lilacs. Some people... Uh, uh, some art historians have called them violets, which um, sort of kind of uh, poetically connects to violence and, and war. But in this case, we also have a woman who is very well dressed. Um, she's sort of uniquely dressed as compared to uh, the faceless businessman over here. She's got this feathered hat. She's got a parasol, a distinctive purse down here. So perhaps she could be seen as like an eternal bride, you know, somebody who lost her fiance at war. But, but here we've got uh, sort of a more peaceful blue sky, a more peaceful sea behind her and that barrier there. The last image from that um, series that Magritte painted is this one here, which I feel like is probably the least interesting out of all of them, a uh, man with his face obscured by a flying bird. And I just show it to you because we also have the photograph of Magritte working on it. And um, so we see him here kind of later in his life. This is just a few years before he died. And he's still sitting at an easel wearing a business suit to paint his paintings. Now, I will tell you as somebody who is married to an artist, comes home absolutely filthy every single day. <laughs> He's covered in paint and other materials. And so the fact that, that Magritte could paint in a suit just tells me, first of all, kind of how he, how he thought about his own profession and that it was, he was trying to be professional in, in this kind of traditional sense, but also sort of how orderly and fastidious he must have been in order to, um, to wear a suit while he was working. 
So let's wrap up with Magritte's uh, artistic legacy. And I'll try to go through this pretty quickly, but it is a little bit of a longer section. So this is a self-portrait of the artist uh, that's called The Magician. This is from 1957, I believe. He's painted himself with, um, with four arms and he's cutting his food and he's eating his food and he's pouring his wine. And I think it's a great sort of note to end on because there is something so magical about his works of art. Um, he is a magician in so many ways. He produced about um, a thousand paintings over a roughly 50 year career. And then on top of that, there's about 700 other works that are works on paper and even some works in, in sculpture. And those were works that he basically oversaw and, and gave the check mark to. There were other people actually making the sculptures. Um, before he died, he had a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, so he was sort of at the top of his game, but he still suffered um, sort of criticism from colleagues in the art world who said that he repeated his own motifs and, and copied his own paintings a little bit too much. Psychoanalysts would say that, that going back like that um, is, is a result of the trauma that he experienced as, as a child. So you could kind of see it either way for sure. All right, so let me just go through this sort of quickly. Um, many of his works inspired works by other artists. The False Mirror from 29 certainly inspired um, uh, M.C. Escher's painting from 1947, or his drawing, I should say. The close-up of the eyeball, we see Escher has included, you know, the eyebrow, the eyelashes, and instead of that perfect reflection, we have the, the um, ghostly reflection of, of a skull here. Uh, but because Magritte is so connected to advertising, it's probably not surprising that the CBS logo was in part inspired by Magritte's painting as well. And, um, and the man who uh, was founded CBS, his name is William S. Paley, he was also on the board of the Museum of Art and Art, which is where this painting is located. So he uh, might have been partially inspired by it as well. Then you have the Beatles. The Beatles um, had an art dealer friend who introduced them to uh, Rene Magritte and Paul McCartney in particular, you can see he's hanging out here with a Magritte painting and a poster. Here's um, John Lennon with that same painting in the background. Uh, McCartney loved the sense of humor and he loved the, the um, symbolic meaning of that apple too. To him, it meant something really fresh. And so, um, so they of course named the record company Apple Records and they put the image of a green apple on their records too. Uh, the B-sides, as I understand it, always had um, the sliced open apple there. So it became really cool. And even though Steve Jobs didn't direct directly um, name Apple computers after Apple records, it certainly provided some cool cachet that might have supported his decision <laughs> to name it that. Um, so shortly after Magritte's death, you even have um, artists like Norman Rockwell looking at Magritte's work and kind of um, using those same symbols. Uh, look at how Rockwell has used that blue sky in the background here in order to create his painting called Mr. Apple, which dates to 1970. And in this case, Mr. Apple um, has a whole head that's an apple. It's not a face that's been sort of slightly obscured here. Um, if you're familiar, uh, again, with scary movies, um, uh, I believe it was Ellen Bernstein who was in The Exorcist, and she talked in um, in one of the, the commentaries uh, on one of the, the DVDs about how the movie poster was directly lifted from Magritte's painting, The Empire of Light. Um, you have a record or recording artists who use Magritte imagery in, on, on their records in order to sell their music. Um, in this case, it's sticks. And then you have Paul, Paul Simon who wrote that lovely song, sang that lovely song about Renee and Georgette Magritte with their dog after the war. Now I've given this presentation a couple of times this month and I'm amazed by how many people who have not heard this song. So cue it up on your playlist right now because it's absolutely beautiful. I guess a lot of critics panned it when it was first um, first created, but now it's really sort of come around and people really see it as like this masterpiece. And it was in part inspired by the photograph that you see over here of Magritte and his wife in, um, in his final years. So it's really poetic too. And in some ways kind of, um, 
kind of a surrealist work because he just starts uh, incorporating almost random references uh, throughout the work. Uh, more inspiration here. If you're familiar with the um, Absolute Vodka um, advertising campaign, which many people think is like the best advertising campaign of all time, this is completely Rene Magritte. This is the play of word and image. Absolute Vodka or Absolute Chicago has the text uh, um, flying off of the bottle here because it's the Windy City. Over here, Absolute Hollywood, we have obfuscation. Um, so we don't even see the bottle itself, we see behind it. And then there, they even did produce a, a complete Magritte, Magritte reference with absolutely not absolute. Uh, more uh, popular culture references, if you're familiar with The Simpsons, the um, that opening sequence with the sky and the clouds, I don't think is accidental. I think it's a reference to Magritte. They um, make a lot of Magritte references over the year. Here's Bart Simpson in a gallery where um, his own face is being used in a, in a reference to Son of Man. And then this is my absolute favorite, the Springsonian Museum, where the elite meet Magritte. That's what we have done tonight, for sure. But even the, the Toy Story movies are really inspired by the work of Magritte. That wallpaper in the little boy's bedroom is not an accident. In. It's that same blue sky, the same fluffy clouds, and then the juxtaposition of these different disparate objects. Um, so the playfulness that comes from it. And then many of you have probably seen the Thomas Crown Affair. I'm embarrassed to say I never saw the original, but I did see the 1999 version with Pierce Brosnan. There's a climactic scene that involves Magritte, no spoilers, um, but here's just a screenshot from the movie where he had a bowler hat. And this is actually a Magritte painting over here called the fifth season when he's going through his Renoir phase. Um, that sort of ties in nicely with the movie too. You have painters um, of optical illusions these days. This is a painting by an artist named um, Rob Gonsalves from 2001. He's using that same blue sky puffy clouds um, to create a picture that is really just optical illusion. The bridge sort of dissolves into these boats in the foreground. He does a lot of work like this. And this is, um, this is sort of like the, the, the next step in the evolution of Magritte. I don't think he would have liked this though because it's too easy to understand. In this case, it's just about optical illusion. There's no mystery behind it. One of the last um, influences that I wanted to share with you is a book that I've been reading for quite some time because I have little kids and it's hard to finish a book. But this is a book by, um, a man named Simon Lancaster, who is one of the greatest speechwriters on the planet. And it's called You Are Not Human, How Words Kill. So he's talking about how leaders can use metaphors and symbols in their language that, you know, results in people committing acts of atrocity, essentially. And he spends a lot of time in his book, not surprisingly, as we look at the cover, on Magritte, on the Apple, on the Beatles and Apple record, and on Steve Jobs and, and Apple computers. So it's really, it's, it's amazing to see the line that he draws through all of these familiar symbols and to think about the power of them. So we'll head back to Magritte for just a moment, thinking about where you can see them if you're like itching to get on a plane right now, <laughs> or at least make plans for someday getting on a plane. You can go to Belgium, not surprisingly, and go to the Magritte Museum there. Most of that collection was donated by his wife. There's also the Menel Collection, which is in Houston, uh, Texas, and they have one of the largest collections of surrealist art, beyond, uh, including Magritte and way beyond as well, right there in Houston. If you wanted to buy your own Magritte, I've got bad news for you. They're getting more and more expensive. <laughs> so every time one goes for auction, and it goes up, uh, the, the value of it goes up by um, a couple of millions of dollars. So the heartstring here that we kind of started off with tonight was sold for just under 18 million in 2007. Um, the Empire of Light, this version of it from 1929, sold for a little bit more than 20 million that same year. And then I think the most recent sale is this one on the right. Believe it or not, this is another portrait of that patron of the arts, Edward James. 
This is called the Pleasure Principle. It sold in 2018 for close to 30 million. So, um, so it's getting really expensive to be a Magritte uh, uh, buyer, <laughs> collector, but believe it or not, there's only about 10 of them in the world. Uh, our former uh, Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, he was uh, Secretary of Commerce under Trump and he was a billionaire himself. He owns approximately $100 million worth of Magritte paintings. And these are photographs of his uh, Manhattan penthouse shortly before he sold it. And if you've got a really good eye, you can see that there's a number of Magritte paintings here. So, um, so it's not an easy game to get into. So we will wrap up tonight with kind of a classic Magritte over here. This is a picture called Infinite Recognition from 1963. I just love it because it looks like two, two guys just hanging around in the middle of the sky, chit chatting. But, um, but we've got, you know, all, it, all of these associations now because we know so much about Magritte. So we know that he began his career in advertising and that his work inspired generations of advertisers. We know that his paintings have the allure of the familiar and the tease of the inscrutable. And we know that while he used this kind of personal iconography, his pictures seem to possess this near universal appeal. And they that mystery that he was trying to attain in his pictures, it continues on and on, and they just call us back again and again. So with that, I will end for tonight, <laughs> tip my hat to you, and I welcome any questions or comments that anybody has about Renee Magritte. Thank you so much, Jane. My pleasure. I'll start going back through these questions. Thank you so much, Jane. I just had to close my, I had my, I had the presentation up on my phone. And so it's right next to me now. Okay. Um, but one of the things I noticed, um, and I don't know if you have any information on this right now, but it might be cool for a future presentation is that um, I think it was um, Storm or Strom Thorgerson used a lot of the images related, they were influenced at least by, it must have been influenced by Rene Magritte for the album covers of um, Pink Floyd. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I'm sure there's a connection. Oh, you're there. on mute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up, Jess. I, I mean, I didn't come across uh, any like direct associations in, in my research, but that's not to say that they weren't inspired by it. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. I, I, I think you could sort of uh, rest assured that they were probably inspired by Magritte. And I see Janine asked, um, Oh, she, okay, she asked me in, in a direct message, can you tell us the difference again between surrealism and Dada? Um, this is a little bit tough because I don't have a Dada image uh, for us on the screen at the moment, but a Dada work could be something like Duchamp's famous sculpture of a urinal where he just put selected a urinal for display. So with Dada, it was oftentimes, uh, works that were uh, purposely absurd, <laughs> uh, purposely meaningless even. And for surrealists, they were very consciously trying to uh, tap into the unconscious mind, to, uh, to uh, tap into the reality that exists in the unconscious mind, to create a dreamscape. So they weren't going for things that were completely nonsensical, but they were going for things, particularly with Magritte, that were... Um, that had the allure of a mystery that had the that had the allure of like somebody describing their dream to you and whenever somebody does that you always you can always tell like oh this sounds like a dream it has this like you know irrational reality that goes along with it and for Magritte that was about this um that interplay of the interior lives of objects when you put disparate objects together so that was a little bit verbose but I hope that sort of gets to that question about the difference between surreal Surrealism and data. Surrealism sort of stands on the shoulders of data, though, because data sort of released the floodgates of like art can be anything. Um, so, so it sort of had to come first. But that was a good question, Jeanine. I love the I love the idea of data because I love collage, and I think yeah. that like the idea of just like 
taking from magazines, taking from current news and just mixing it up and just posting it is, is really kind of cool. Um, but I missed your answer to the, um, to the Pink Floyd question. Sorry about that. Oh yeah, no problem. I would say I, I didn't come across anything specifically in my research, but, um, just trying to conjure up in my brain, like what some of those look like. I would, I, I, I think that you can safely say that they were inspired by Magritte to a certain extent. Yeah, I think I think you could definitely make that case. Oh yeah, I would, just looking for other questions. Yeah, I think it would be really cool to, um, to investigate the source material for a lot of the famous rock albums of like the 20th century. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Because we had sticks in there. Um, yeah. I, I think a lot of that, I, I think illusion became really important to a lot of them, um, optical illusion, really. So I think that would be like its own fascinating art talk right there, Jess. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Breton had very strict opinions of what surrealism is and often fell out with artists. What mm. is what was his opinion slash relationship to Magritte? Ron, I wish I was a little bit better prepared to answer that particular question. Um, I just know the facts of Magritte's life, which was he kind of um, retreated from Paris and my senses didn't really look back after his three years there. Um, Bre Breton, um, I think was a fiery figure and uh, I, I just sort of, pulling facts from the back of my brain here. I mean, people would end up like physically fighting because of Breton. So, um, so I think that, um, that, that Magritte essentially carved his own path after his little experiment in Paris. And, and I'm not sure he and Breton maintained much of a, a relationship beyond that. Um, but that's a really good question. I, I should go back and, and be better acquainted with that aspect of his life. Good question, Ron. And thank you for the, the very kind words that people are putting in here. I hope you're yeah. queuing up the the um, the Paul Simon song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could I could play that for everyone, or I could just send it along. I'll send a link along with the um, with the recording tonight. And um, so thank you, Jane. Uh, we won't keep you on. Someone just sent something in. What was? No, that's it. Okay. Um, but thank you, Jane, so much for coming online with us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. And um, don't forget that the next one is coming up on September, let's see, September 28th, I think. That's right. And that's on the, yeah, September 28th on September 28th on the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, which I think will be such a great departure from some of the things that you've been covering so far, which have been mostly modern art, right? Yeah, there's been a lot of modern art this year. Yeah. Um, but spoiler alert, it won't be just the Brotherhood. There will be some women too, so. Okay. <laughs> I hope so. I always hope for that. That's great. Um, and Janine says, yay. Thank you <laughs> so much, Jane. Thank you, everyone. I'll send this recording out tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Take good care. Bye. Have a good night. Good night.